is this thing on? Welcome back to Big Mouth and fancy seeing you here in June. A very welcome, my friends, and especially my enemies. Come in, sit down, no touching. I don't do the touching. Did you hear how hard I slapped my face? Wow, welcome to Friday's edition of the DCEU Daily. And if you're feeling charitable, please smash the subscribe button and the like button. And please follow me on Twitter, at Movies TV Mad. It's very funny. I expose a hell of a lot of haters. And it's just a hell of a lot of fun. So I just want to give a, a big high five to Film Gob. He's one of the most prominent members of the DCEU, Zack Snyder, released the Snyder Cut community. His a YouTube channel normally consists of edits, exposing bloggers, exposing people like Campia, or just doing live videos talking about the DCEU and whatever he wants to talk about. But yesterday, he did a very, very special video. He actually got Ray Fisher to be part of this video. And this is just a video you can see uh, my um, my pal uh, Chris Wong Svensson there as well. He's got all these people to talk about how they're dealing uh, with lockdown. It was a really good video, 32 minutes. So go and find um, Film Gob on YouTube. Subscribe and watch this brilliant video. We're going to watch a little bit of it, not all of it, because we, we're ranking. We're ranking the DCEU today. Very controversial ranking. It's going to upset a lot of people. I don't like upsetting people, although it's funny sometimes, isn't it? So I'm really excited about this ranking. But first, let's check this out. Hey, this is Chris. Hey, guys. The Comic Movie Mark. Welcome. It's the guy. It's Lady Shantia. Hi, everyone. Hello, everybody. I'm Purple Boy. Sure, to be shot, Yeah, no. Nah, appreciate you doing that. Appreciate everything you do and all your support. Uh, you already know. Let's see. Uh, film guy, let's see what we, let's see what you know. What, what advice would you give fans of lockdown to keep their mind busy? Well, it's tough, you know. It's weird because like I feel like a lot of the things that I like to do naturally, like playing video games and watching movies and TV, I I think I like those things a lot because I don't get to do them as much as I want because I you know you get busy with things on a day to day. So now that I'm in a place where it's like all I can do is watch movies and all I can do is play video games and read and do things that are isolated within the confines of my living space. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find things that are outside of that to do. You know, it's always, at least for me, sometimes it's like the thing you have isn't necessarily the thing you want, you know? Normally I'm a person where like, if I got free time, I'm probably walking around somewhere. Like, I'll be walking around, I'll be on the phone for hours and uh, uh, talking to various people. And so when I come back home, I'm like, hey, listen, I'm about to throw that on some, on some video games or some Smash Brothers. Or, you know, I'm going to get this live stream going. Wow, that's really, really good. And it just gets better. As I say, to have Ray Fisher doing, being part of this, being part of this video that's all been edited together is brilliant. So well done, Film Gob. You really are a class apart. Now, Let's get on with the brand new re-ranking of the DCEU movies. Kind of. So let's get on with this re-ranking of the DCEU. As I say, really excited to be doing this with you guys uh, this morning. And not much else going on within the DCEU. I've covered everything for you. So this is just a fun re-ranking. Um, on this piece of paper, don't look, don't look, it's a secret, right? This is between me right right now. You're going to find out very shortly. We are counting down from number nine to number one. Number nine, there's not nine DCEU movies. There is now. And I'll explain myself when we get to that movie, which you probably think shouldn't be on the list Anyway, so let's go, go, go. Drum rolls, please. At number nine is the latest DCEU movie, Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Why is that at the bottom? Why is not Justice League at the bottom? First of all, Birds of Prey had major, major production problems. When Grace Randolph knows the whole broad outline of your story, you've got a problem. Now, Grace and many bloggers were allowed to visit the set of Justice League, and she still didn't know that the shit of problems that were going on on that production lot. 
She knew nothing. Nobody, none of us knew the problems until after we saw the film, after Justice League was released. So what were the problems with um, Birds of Prey? The problems were that Margot Robbie was allowed to be, this was her baby. She wanted to have a Harley Quinn movie. She wanted to make it feminist. She wanted to implement a production company which had mostly female people working on it. And she really wanted to have an alt-left agenda piece in this Birds of Prey movie. This quickly went wrong um, with, with um, bringing in Kathy Yan as the director. Kathy is a really talented young woman, but she's never done a film of this size. And when I talk about Birds of Prey, it's not a big film. The actual film isn't a big film. It's no bigger than kind of what she's made before. But in terms of the property... In, te in terms of the iconic nature of DC and Harley Quinn and all these characters, you know, this was a great opportunity, not just for um, Kathy. And I can't blame Kathy totally for this film. If, if at all, this was this narrative came from Margot Robbie. Really, she's got away with a lot of the criticism. Everyone's just talking nicely about her. It was Margot Robbie who set up the, the pro female production company. It was Margot Robbie who came up with the idea for the storyline. It was her idea to have these birds of prey be in the background and not even look like the birds of uh, prey in the graphic novels in the DC Comics, right? She wanted to do this. And everything, the, the whole procedure of this film was about alt-left, feminist SJW politics. This quickly went wrong when they realised that Kathy Yan didn't have a clue how to shoot action set pieces. So they brought in, is it Chad Levensky? I can never say the geezer's name. He's, he's done John Wick. The John Wick action set pieces look amazing. We all know that. They brought him in, but not before Kathy Yan realised she couldn't do it. She got herself in an almighty mess. And when, when the Warner Brothers hierarchy, sorry, and I'm talking about Anne Sarnoff and John Stanky, they were horrified. They were horrified. They didn't like what they saw. But, this is not just a problem with this production. The production had another problem. Somehow, Grace Randolph had found out, and this is true. I now know this to be true. I mean, me and Grace don't have a relationship at all. She blocked me on Twitter. But I can tell you at this time, Grace Randolph was absolutely spot on. It doesn't mean I all of a sudden love her to bits. I think she does a good job. I think she's a bit of a troublemaker. I think a lot of the things she says are nonsense. But this time, she was right. She, she had found out from her sources, and she does have sources, it's all about the Wonder Woman changing of the timeline thing. She's spot on about that as well. But that's not really a big deal to me. This is. She found out that the diamond that actually is the whole kind of narrative of this film would actually have footage of, a, a, let's call it a sausage pick, right? A willy pick, whatever you want to call it, so I don't get this video suspended, right? Basically, there's footage of the Black Mask's um, sausage, right? And this is the whole idea. This was supposed to strengthen the alt-left feminist SJW agenda of men sending women pictures of their sausages without the women asking for it, right? So that was the whole point of that. What Grace Randolph found out was true. Now, once she broke the story on, on, her, on her channel, on, her, on Grace's YouTube channel, Warner Brothers told Margot, basically, you change that now or the film doesn't come out. This film will not see the light of day or basically we'll sack Kathy and we'll bring in our own director. In fact, the idea was to actually get Chad Levensky to remake this film, right? He is, he is a director as well. He could have directed the film. So there was, there was some big moves here. So the whole point was that I think a year or so ago or whatever it was that Margot Robbie had said she didn't like the way um, Harley was represented in the Suicide Squad movie, that she wanted she wanted to have this empowering feminist Harley Quinn and she wanted to do certain things, alt left agenda kind of SJ that W stuff. So the idea was because they didn't want to upset Margot and they had a big future planned. Uh, for Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn. And I'm, I'm told that um, James Gunn has got a big future plan for that character now. He's in charge, by the way. He's officially in charge of Harley Quinn now. Warner Brothers have been very, very pleased for his vision of the character. 
Apparently, in the in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, she's such a different character. Um, quite not that different to what she was in David Ayer's Suicide Squad, but a little bit different, not as sexualized. But she's totally like cream crackers and custard compared to what we saw in the Birds of Prey movie. So as well as the production problems, because of this political agenda and this ideology from Margot Robbie, this film is... Is a problematic movie. This film's about one hour and 47 minutes long. I think I think this is the shortest DCEU movie. So there's not much room to breathe in this movie. And basically, this is a Harley Quinn movie. Now, when I was defending this movie, when I saw it before anyone else did, I was defending it. I was trying to go the opposite direction to everyone else. I didn't want to jump on it. Everyone on the Snyder community was being really nasty. And I didn't think that was, I don't like bullying. And it was getting a bit too deep and dark and deep cuts really what people were saying. But when I when I started re-watching the film two or three times, I realised this film isn't a particularly interesting film. When you put it, compare it to every single DCEU movie, it's not a good movie. Uh, Harley Quinn is obsessed with a sandwich. Um, there's some interesting moments. There is some interesting moments with the uh, young Miss Kane. I like that dynamic. That was interesting at times. But ultimately, this movie is a bit of a mess. It's okay to watch it harmlessly. As I say, it fits in nicely um, in my collection of the DCEU. But, and this, this can be fixed. The Birds of Prey don't look like the Birds of Prey. They don't particularly act like the Birds of Prey. And they're not dressed like the Birds of Prey. It's an absolute mess. This was such an opportunity for a great Birds of Prey movie with involving uh, Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn. She could have set up the team, then moved on. She does move on, and she kind of does set them up. They just don't feel like the, the iconic Birds of Prey from the comics, or even any animated movies we've seen them on. But here's the thing. They haven't destroyed the Birds of Prey kind of IP. They can still use those actors, but give them the iconic feel, the iconic look, and the iconic costumes. So this can be fixed. I think that's going to be up to James Gunn. To fix that, he's pretty much um, in charge now of that end of the DCEU. I've already exclusively revealed that um, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 um, will probably be his last MCU movie. Maybe he can make some DCEU, but he's going to focus on the DCEU for now after Guardians 3. So that's very exciting. And they're the reasons for me, really, that Birds of Prey is at the bottom. It's just full of ideology and agendas that don't work. If you are going to imprint so much whiny complaining about how women get it bad and men take credit for all women's work, if you're going to do it, at least take your size nines off. Tiptoe through it. They didn't tiptoe through it. Men bad. Men, uh, women victims. It was terrible. It was really terrible. Most of the people being beaten up, most of the villains were men. It was a terrible attempt and nobody, but nobody watching a comic book movie wants wants to be watching blatant DM ch chomping um, feminist agenda in their comic book movies. It's why it didn't make very much money. Um, more men than women like Captain Marvel, but Captain Marvel was a massive hit. Um, the difference is with Captain Marvel, it's an OK, solid movie. It's not a brilliant movie, but it's not a bad movie either. All the negativity came from from a reaction from, you know, the toxicity that Brie Larson was spewing out. The difference is, uh, very quickly within that marketing, Brie Larson was told off, and she started being uh, acting a bit of a ditz and smiling, and they had her there with other actors. They got away with it. Birds of Prey didn't get away with anything, because there wasn't much negativity within the marketing, but it was obvious for everyone to see that there was massive problems. And, um, of course, the bloggers and the pundits and the critics gave this a, a, a clean bill of health in the reviews. And, you, again, you have to question why. There, there, there's corruption here. I've gone on about this film far too much, but at the end of the day, we have got all, to, all the time in the world. We have all the time in the world. Da -da 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 -da. I've been getting into Bond, and that was on my Bond compilation the other day. I need to do a James Bond video, actually. So that's Birds of Prey. That's why it's bottom. It's the duck that simply doesn't hunt. Now, at number eight, I don't think it comes to any surprise to anyone that Justice League is my number eight this time. Uh, basically, Birds of Prey is propping it up. 
I mean, we could sit here and talk about Justice League and what happened. But the truth of the matter is, unlike Birds of Prey, I was revealing stuff to you there that you probably didn't know totally what a mess it was. As I say, Birds of Prey is a bigger mess behind the scenes and in front of the scenes than Justice League. One of the things is that we didn't really know what was going on with Justice League, apart from the directors changing until after the film. That's when all the revelations started spilling out, thanks to Zack Snyder and the excellent job he has, has been doing of marketing his own film. And apparently HBO Max have been liking some posts from the release of Snyder Cut community. That's interesting. We'll see how that develops. But yes, Justice League isn't a bad film within itself. The problem with Justice League is that Joss Whedon was just not given the platform to make a finished um, product, right? So we see the upper lip problems with Henry Cavill. Something you, basically... You, we should never have seen that. That film should not have been released in that condition. But that was down to Kevin Sujihara Hara rushing uh, Joss Whedon. They forced Zack Snyder out. We know the history. Ultimately, Justice League is just a Frankenstein's monster. You can't really judge the film on its own merits. It's difficult. He just didn't have the time to rework the movie. So this film has elements that I really like and elements where I think, oh, my God. They really didn't do that. I remember going to see the film, really excited, ignoring the negative reviews, because I thought we always get negative reviews with the DCEU, and just being so stunned how bad the finished product of this film was. And that's why it's my number eight. Now, this is a positive number seven, because there's just so many good movies above it. Number seven is Shazam. Shazam is a film I really, really like. I think it's an amazing film. I think it's really the first family movie entry into the DCEU franchise, and it's so successful. It didn't make much money, but it made much, much, enough money to say, do you know what? We beat our profit. We got a profit. It's healthy. We didn't, we didn't spend much money on this movie, so there wasn't a worry there. But the actual film is really, really good. I thought David F. Sandberg did a terrific job. There are issues within this film. The Superman cameo just simply doesn't work for me, which is a shame they couldn't get Henry. It was too close after Justice League, and there were still too many issues. But I think they should have made the decision then. Keep Henry or not, bring a new Superman. They could have introduced a new Superman. How amazing would that have been? But anyway, the film is really, really good. It, it really is very faithful to the new 52 version of Shazam, we've got the Black Adam movie with The Rock coming. This um, this franchise within a franchise is just going to grow and grow. And I really, it's just a very enjoyable movie. But as much as the fun, there's lots of dark elements to this film. It's not a film I've rewatched a terribly am amount of times. I don't think it's for me a rewatchable film, but I do like it and I do approve of it. And it's my number seven. Number six is David Ayer's Suicide Squad. Well. This is a bit like Justice League, isn't it? And the theatrical cut of BVS. This film was just repurposed to death. What they did to David Ayer was just despicable. And as I've been speaking a lot about Suicide Squad and David Ayer, because he's been saying a lot on Twitter. He's really funny on Twitter. He sees the humour in it all now, which is brilliant. Um, but despite how much they messed with this man's film, because the actual scenes were still shot by him, I hope and I think there's a lot of good stuff in this movie, but cutting out Jared Leto's Joker was a disgrace. They, Jared was one of my favourite parts of this movie. I love Margot's Harley. I love Will Smith's Deadshot. I think Will Smith is never talked about enough in this movie. He is brilliant, brilliant casting by David Ayer and Zack Snyder, by the way. It's a really good film, but the, my favourite thing about this film is the Batman cameos. They're really, really good. I like the Flash cameos. This film might be the most interconnected DCEU film. That's why it's so tragic that they're going away from what David Ayer was doing. This was the third movie of the DCEU coming after BBS. I still think it was too early for a Suicide Squad movie. A discussion we've already had and a future discussion for another time. But I like the opening segment when Waller is walking through and she's about to, to meet all the governors and the armies and all that. And she says Superman changed the world when he flew across the sky. He changed the world again when he didn't. So interconnected from what's just happened in BVS. And when she goes into that um, meeting, she's constantly talking about Superman. 
And it's brilliant. So interconnected with the rest of the DCEU, the third movie in the history of this franchise at the time. So I really like that element. I like this film. It's a solid film. But if they just allowed David Ayer's movie to be released as the theatrical cut, it would have been an even better experience. So that's why it is where it is on my list. It's number six. I enjoy it. But... Again, Suji Hara not only betrayed Zack Snyder, but he betrayed David Ayer. So we're in the top five now. What do you think is my number five? Are you guessing? Do you know? Right. At number five is, um, is James Wan's, the brilliant James Wan, Aquaman. And again, Aquaman is a precursor for this Aquaman universe within a universe, which is the DCEU. I'm very, very excited for James's future plans within this universe. Can't wait to see Aquaman 2 in 2022. Aquaman is brilliant. I, I just want to say the pressure that James must have been under coming after Justice League. What do we do? Is, is there going to be some interconnectivity here? Do we just ignore Justice League? They pretty much ignored Justice League, apart from Mira mentioning in Steppenwolf, which I think was a wise move. This film is a standalone as it gets, but without Aquaman saying anything, you know he's already had the Justice League experience. You know he's been there. He's got a little bit of experience now as Aquaman. I love the opening to this movie. I, I like Black Manta. A lot of people said that Black Manta was forced into the movie. Whether he was or not, and Jeff Johns wanted him in, I personally think Jeff Johns was right to put him in the movie. That's just my personal opinion. He's a very important character in the Aquaman universe. And it was important that we were introduced to the character. But it's such a good film. This is about a character, a fish out of water, if you like, but in the water. I've said before, it's like me when I used to come on holiday out here in Cyprus because I was born and raised in the UK by my Greek Cypriot parents. When I was over here, I was a foreigner. When I was in the UK, I was a foreigner. This is exactly the narrative in this movie. And it's beautiful. Freaking beautiful. He feels a little bit... He does feel like the Earth is his home. Or kind of. The upper land is his home, right? The surface world, as they call it. But he still feels a little bit on the outside. And when he goes... To Atlantis, he feels like an, an even more outsider then. The performance in this, is in this film, the visuals, the music, again, again, is beautiful. I mean, the DCEU soundtracks are just beautiful. The scores we get from these beautiful musicians is something special. So Aquaman means a hell of a lot to me. I think it's a really good film. And I, I think most of you joined this channel when you saw my video, when I actually saw the test screening of Aquaman and I was purring about it for 20, 30 minutes, it was a great film. And it needed to be a great film. Now, people like Collider were calling it a mess. I don't know what you judge as a mess. You probably liked Iron Man 2, right? That's a mess. Aquaman isn't a mess. Jason Momoa is the perfect um, 21st century Aquaman. He nails the role. And James Wan made a brilliant um, comic book movie. So, a brilliant CBM, and I really like it. Now, we're on to the top four. Now, for a lot of Snyder acolytes, this is going to hurt. Not that you care what my opinion is anyway, but this is just my opinion right now. Batman v Superman is my number four. Batman v Superman, where is it? I was supposed to hold up the Blu-rays every time I talked, but I forgot. Never mind. Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, The Ultimate Edition. This film is amazing. There will never be a CBM made in this fashion again for so many reasons. Mainly because of the reaction to it, the divisive nature of it. But this is a bloody good film. So why is it a number four? As I said, the top three are very competitive for me. And there will be arguments about my choices. I understand this, this ranking. My, I've done rankings on here before. They change all the time. And quite right too. It depends on your mood, doesn't it? This is three hours of brilliance. Three hours of brilliance that wasn't everyone's cup of tea. And if only Warner Brothers marketed this film and they were brave enough to market this film for what it was and not a popcorn chomping fight between Batman and Superman, it probably would have grossed well over a billion dollars and it wouldn't have been as divisive. But this is not the movie 
people were expecting. This wasn't the movie people were expecting because it wasn't marketed as it was. So they did this awful theatrical cut that simply didn't work. People didn't like the film. So then we had to see the ultimate edition. What a mess. No, not the ultimate edition, but the way Warner Brothers dealt with this. This version should have been out from the beginning. And this was a precursor to what they were going to do to David Ayer's Suicide Squad and what they were going to do to Zack Snyder's Justice League. This is a brilliant film. If this is your first time on the channel, watch this film. Be patient with it. It's beautiful. And it really it has got some brilliant underlining themes. So Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice is my number four. So what's, where, where's my list? It's really messy on this bed. You don't want to see it. It really is gross. Anyway, this is the top three. My third movie is very a controversial choice. And I'm going to try and spin it and plug it, but you're still not going to agree with me. Number three is Joker movie, uh, directed by Todd Phillips and starring Joaquin Phoenix. Why is this on a DCEU list? Because this is a DCEU movie. I know this is supposed to be the, the, the beginning, the origins of the Black Label, but this is literally part of the new DC movies. It's part of the DCEU. I know officially it's not part of the DCEU, but it's all in line with these new movies. So I'm pulling it in. A controversial choice. You're not going to like it. Abuse me in the comments below. Dislike if you want or like if you want. I don't really care. So let's talk about Todd Phillips. Where are we? Where are we? Joker movie. Can you see I've got the steel box set there? Is that what they call it? Anyway. Joking, basically whacking, joking, oh, I said bloody joke. Whacking Phoenix and Robert De Niro. Right. Robert De Niro's barely in this movie, but when he's in it, he's electric, isn't he? So Todd Phillips got the idea about this film because he's obsessed with Taxi Driver. He's obsessed with Scorsese. Scorsese was going to direct this movie, but he went away from the project. And I think Todd Phillips was the next choice. I only knew um, Todd Phillips from those three jokey movies he did, and I forgot what they were called now. The Hangover movies, right? I've never seen them. I'll be honest, I've never seen the Hangover movies. So I never knew what a Todd Phillips film was, and I never even went to, went to see them when I heard Todd was doing the Joker movie. But as soon as I heard that Joaquin Phoenix was playing the Joker, I knew we had something special on our hands. But of course, we live in, a, in the world of this... Insane culture war. They were gunning for this film. Oh, it'd be dangerous for us to see it. You see the parallels between Joker movie and um, Birds of Prey. Now, it's very, very interesting that the extreme leftists, the feminists in the SJWs, did everything pre the release of this movie to destroy it. To make sure that you didn't watch it, didn't go and watch it. It didn't make the money that... It needed to make and that critics didn't say nice things about them, but about it. But the more critics oozed delight over this movie, the more the agenda driven critics were voting this movie down. So it started off really, really high on Rotten Tomatoes and it started to fall. Not that what happens on Rotten Tomatoes bothers me at all. Right. But the Joker movie as it's, it's a bit like BVS. Actually, it's nothing like BVS, but the situation is the same. You will never, ever see a CBM like this again. This is a film that tells the story of a mentally ill man who's let down by society, by his government, by his local um, council, whatever you want to call them back then. This is set in the 80s. This man has his psych meds take, taken away from him. And we see him, and this is what's so beautiful in the narrative, you see him fall to pieces, bit by bit by bit. And in the end, if only society would look after its mentally ill, they wouldn't come back and bite them on the bum. But nobody takes mental health seriously enough, whether it was in the 80s. Obviously, now we do a bit more, but still, there's a lot more support needed because mental illness isn't one illness. Mental illness could be so many different things. Schizophrenia, depression. Suicidal thoughts. And there's many more conditions that I don't even know about, right? This film is the first film to deal with mental health in such an honest, realistic, and obviously researched way. It was brilliant. 
and the feminists and the SJWs were trying to destroy it. But you know what's so funny about this story? If you pip Margot Robbie's Bird of Prey versus um, Todd Phillips' Joker movie, look who won. Look what the better movie is. Because Joker movie by Todd Phillips is a film that's focusing on making commentary on a problem that needs a light shining on it. Now, Margot Robbie's Suicide, sorry, Margot Robbie's Birds of Prey is about being negative and nasty about men and not really finding a solution to that. What is the solution to that? What is the solution of us men treating women like objects rather than people? We know as men, we know as men that we need to respect women. We know as men that women deserve as much money as, as, as we get paid, right? Uh, women deserve the right opportunities. If a woman doesn't want, it doesn't want you to make love to her, you don't. These are all things. Equality, we know these as, as people. And most decent men understand how to treat women. But unfortunately, 25% of bad people, bad men, run the world. And that's where the problem is. Now, what I would say is, is this the biggest problem in the world? Is this the kind of problem? Or I would say to Kathy Yan and Margot Robbie, surely you could have represented it in a more interesting way, but still have the birds of prey, be the iconic birds of prey and make a brilliant CBM. Because the only thing good about birds of prey isn't Margot Robbie. No, 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 no. The only good thing about birds of prey is black masking Ewan McGregor. That's it. The very thing they didn't, the very, th he's, he's basically supposed to be the face of toxic masculinity. And what happens in this film? The, to the toxic masculinity, we're supposed to all look at and say, oh, he's so bad. We're laughing with him. We're enjoying his character. And the men and the women are keep on saying, yeah, great character. We want to see more of him. It didn't work. Their agenda didn't work. And then when you look at Joker, their agenda failed on so many levels. It's hilarious. The movie made over a billion dollars. It was critically acclaimed. Whacking Phoenix won the Best Actor Oscar, right? It should have won Best Film again. It should have won the Best Film Oscar, but it didn't. But it's, it's a history-making film. It's the most profitable film of all time. And that's why I was compelled to put Joker movie in this list. It's one of the best ever made. Right, I don't really need this, but it's a bit more dramatic. We have two films left. We have two films left, so we all know what they are. Wonder Woman and Man of Steel. What's number two and what's number one? I'm loving this. This is really good. Best video I've done in ages, although you probably don't agree. So number two is Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman. I really like this film. I really, really freaking well love this film. I actually think if you're looking at aiming at a family audience, but not just a family audience, an audience of men and women uniting together to watch a movie, people of all ages watching a PG movie, whether it's young girls, older girls, or young, basically everyone went in to see this film. It is one of the best experiences because of that. This film really tells a great origin story of Wonder Woman. You know, it, this wasn't an easy thing to do. Again, this film comes after Suicide Squad. This film comes after Batman v Superman. And again, they've got to kind of ignore those movies because those movies were so divisive. Patty Jenkins makes a great film. Now, she's inspired by Dick Donner's Superman the movie. There's no question about that. And I know there's people in this community who put Man of Steel up against Superman the movie. That's up to you. I'll never do that. But I love both films. So Patty really wanted to make a positive movie about this leading female. One of the most iconic characters in fiction, Wonder Woman is. One of the most iconic characters in any comic company's um, kind of catalogue. But definitely the top, you know, she's in the top three of iconic characters at DC. And whatever position you think they lie, Superman's always going to be top for me. I would say right now Wonder Woman's second and Batman's third. That's where I'm looking and maybe Green Lantern's fourth. Uh, we can rank the characters another time. That would be a good ranking, actually, wouldn't it? I don't think any channel actually does that. But Wonder Woman is such a beautifully written and directed film. And again, the music. 
the music is full of love and soul. From the opening scene when Lily Aspel, the, the young Diana, the eight-year-old Diana, or however old she is, is running across Finiscaria, Fantasy Island. I told her this. I told her this on Twitter. I said, she was showing a clip the other day, and I said, what you achieved in that role, Lily, was beautiful. She's such a young actress, and she's so polite. And when the fans talk to her, I, I think she's great. I think she's going to be a big star in the future. As far as I'm concerned, she's a big star now. So from that moment when Lily runs out, I just love this film. I remember going to the cinema out here in Cyprus on my own. My friends weren't available. I was very excited, and I loved it. And just to address the final act, the third act, I love it. I know people hate it. But I love it. It's and it seems one of the reasons people hate it, and we've talked about this before, is because it's a CGI kind of kind of final battle. But what's wrong with that? What is wrong with that? Is is a third act bad just because it's CGI? It it, it doesn't make sense to me. I love the fact that when um, Chris Pine, Steve Trevor is in the plane and he dies, she's thinking. She's basically she's. She's tempted to go dark. She's tempted to kill Dr. Poison. And she doesn't. As she says, as she says, I choose love. Goodbye, brother. I love that when she says that to Aries. When she says that to Aries, goodbye, brother. I think brilliant acting by Gal, by the way. Brilliant directing by Patty. But the whole film is a piece of poetry. It is beautiful. It opens my heart up. It makes me feel nothing but love in a similar way to what Superman the movie did for me as a 10 year old child. There's so many new Wonder Woman fans because of this film. This film works. Yes, her costume's not as dark as it is in BVS, but BVS is, is her future. This is her first venture. So she could wear a darker suit in the future. But I don't care about any of that. This is one of the best comic book movies ever made. Chris Pine's inclusion was genius by Patty Jenkins. They're very good friends. He, he was a brilliant Captain Kirk. He's a brilliant Steve Tre Trevor. And it's just been announced he's going to be the new saint, a.k.a. Simon Templar, a character that, of course, Roger Moore played in the 60s. That's exciting. So Chris is going from strength to strength. But his inclusion was very, very important. Um, I just loved the whole film. But one of the most special things about this movie... When we talk about Brie Larson, when we talk about um, Birds of Prey and Social Justice Warriors, what Patty and Gal did in this movie, having Wonder Woman, having Diana sitting around this fireplace with these new men, these new characters who are male that she's never met before. She doesn't know if she can trust them. And they're all confiding in her. They're opening their hearts to her. And she wants to listen. And she wants to make them better. She wants to help them. Men and women sitting together as equals, not treating Dinah as a sexual object, but just in a way, um, she's kind of been an agony aunt to them. It's a different kind of relationship. It's beautiful. And this is what equality looks like. This is what representation should look like. The way it's done in this first movie. And when the rest of the studios get that, we finally could get beyond this culture war and actually represent people in the right way. So Wonder Woman, directed by Patty Jenkins, starring Gal Gadot and Chris Pine, is my number two DCEU movie. Obviously, number one is the first. Where's it gone? I've lost it. I lost it a long time ago. Anyway, right, Man of Steel is the first DCEU movie. It's obviously the first DCEU movie I saw. This film doesn't get enough love. No, it doesn't. I always hear people fighting for the Snyder Cup, going on about BVS. BVS is brilliant. I love BVS. But this film is barely mentioned anymore. And this film is the best of the freaking lot. This is the best DCEU film. This is the best comic book film ever made. It has everything. When I was a kid and I imagined what a Superman film with all the bells and whistles would look like, it was this. I sat there in the cinema, once on my own, once with my friend and once with my sister. And my sister's not really into those kind of films and she loved it. My brother and his wife, his wife isn't into those kind of films. She loved it. It was visually stunning to see Superman using his powers and fighting. It was so stunning. 
And he was beautiful. He is my number one character, as I repeat every day. And this was a great one. It's not the way I would have written a Superman movie. But for me, personally, it works on every level. It is brilliant. Shannon Zod, we've spoken about so many times. Um, Amy Adams, Lois Lane. We've got a great Perry White as well. The, the, the whole film is just brilliant, exciting. It's, let me explain to you how I feel about Man of Steel. It's like someone has taken one of those injections, you know, to get, what do they call it? Anyway, to get your esteem up. Have you seen those? Anyway, right? Um, so It's like when um, Martin McFly drinks that wake-up juice in Back to the Future 3, and it's like, like that, right? This is what Man of Steel is. It, it's like an adrenaline shot. That's the word I'm looking for. It's like a shot of adren adrenaline for two and a half hours. And when it's over, you want more. I want more of this adrenaline. Wait, 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 you're taking it away from me now? I can't see more of this? That's what this film is. It's pure adrenaline from shot one to the final shot. It's amazing. I've never seen a film so full of adrenaline and excitement. And when it finishes, you're addicted to it and you want more. That's what's so good about Man of Steel. It's my number one DCEU movie, but I want to know what you think. I want you to do your lists. You don't have to add Joker if you don't agree with me doing that. But let me know what your top eight DCEU movies are. Comment down below. Like, share and subscribe. I really enjoyed doing this ranking. I hope you enjoyed it too. And I'll see you tomorrow for even more DCEU Daily. See you again soon.